or toll free triple eight seven two three W T A M. Does anyone ever call that? Does anyone ever call me on that line except for Dick from Dayton? I don't think so. I got a box. There's a box there. Ray Davis's handwriting. It says Rick Gilmore's box. I don't know what's in it. I was showing it to Cliff Bakley through the news window there, and uh, we thought maybe it was going to blow up. We weren't sure, but there's something in it that's, that's not very heavy. It's like something, I don't know, plasticky or something. I have no idea what it is. Who, who would send me something? It doesn't say what the heck it's for or anything. I had no clue. I want to talk a little, and maybe you do as well, about Cleveland uh, DJ legend... Bill Randall passed away at the age of either 79 or 80 or 81, depending on what source you get. The plane dealer said 81. Then I read someplace else 80. I can, I can tell you some, some stories about him that you may not have heard. Well, I'm certain you probably haven't heard these because I heard them from someone who worked with Bill Randall as his producer from the late 70s into the era of sometime in the 80s. I'm not certain how long exactly. Flash Gordon was with him. A friend of mine, Flash Gordon's a local DJ type. Had a nightclub years ago called The Real Flash Gordon over there at uh, Cam's Corners. Well, when Flash was in high school, he was Bill Gordon's producer. Or whipping boy, depending on how you look at your producer. And eventually, the principal of Fairview High School, who's not the principal anymore, so I guess he's not any kind of a public figure, so I guess I won't name him. I'll just call him Wally. Wally called the radio station that Bill was at at the time, and I think it was W, what was it, WBBG, something like that, and said, you cannot have a student who's in high school working for you as your producer. And so Flash had to give it up. But Flash was telling me, I sat down with him a couple nights ago, and I said, tell me something about Bill Randall, because you worked for him, and you were friends with him, and you, and you knew him. And he said, well, I'll tell you one thing. He says, I don't know what, you know, everybody seems to remember him for bringing Elvis Presley to Brooklyn High School, and for breaking a lot of people, making, making them, not breaking them in a bad way, I mean, breaking their music out. He says, what people don't know is that Bill Randall invented the sock hop. It was the idea that you would go dancing on the school gym floor, because that was the best place to hold a dance, and they didn't want people in their street shoes. So they'd tell everybody, take your shoes off. Thusly, the sock hop began. I remember him telling, Flash told me a story once about, well, Bill Randall, no dum-dum. He had doctorate degrees, he flew his own airplane, he flew back and forth from Oklahoma City to Cleveland to get his law degree, he became a lawyer. And he was not a poor man. He worked hard and made a lot of money and saved his money and that sort of thing. And this according to Flash, Bill Gordon owned a Rolls Royce at one point and had a vanity plate on it that said Randall. And somebody beat the crap out of it with a baseball bat. Just, just, you know, vandalized and destroyed his car. And Bill said, never again will I ever have... And apparently they didn't do it because I don't know who would hate Bill Randall. Although he was, to some, a crusty curmudgeon. A crusty curmudgeon isn't enough to have somebody beat up your Rolls Royce. They probably did it because it was a Rolls Royce and they were jealous of him. And he said, never again will I have a vanity plate on my car. Another story I heard was that uh, he had a brand new gold Cadillac. Now, he was a busy guy. And he went to his, maybe it wasn't gold, but I believe that's what I was told. It was a gold Cadillac. And he went to a party for his parents. And his brother was there. And Bill Randall asked his brother, what's this party for? Well, he had no idea that it was his parents' golden wedding, at wedding anniversary. So he gave his parents his brand new Cadillac. 
So there's a guy who, perhaps a crusty curmudgeon, but generous at heart. I also heard a story from Flash about Bill Gordon that said, Bill would come in often late for work. He, uh, I don't know if you've ever been a disc jockey or ever watched a DJ work with vinyl, work with records, and there's a way that they teach you how to cue records. If you've been to broadcast school, which I have not, but uh, like producer Patty, did they ever teach you how to cue records where you turn the record a certain amount? Turn your microphone on. Did you go to broadcast school? I did go to broadcast school. Now, I don't even know if they bother showing you vinyl anymore. No. Okay. It was the, all digital. What they would do with vinyl is you would turn it a certain amount forward until the music would start, and then you'd pull it back. So then that way, when you would start it, you, it, would, it would be clean, right? Uh, Bill Gordon would show flat, Flash knew how to do that. And he said, no, that's not the way you do it. You cue records by eye. How's that for old school? You take it at one and a half turns. If you go one and a half turns back, then when you turn the record on, he says Bill Gordon would come into work late, carrying his briefcase with his trench coat over his arm. And he would walk in and look at Flash and say, what's the first song? And the record was already cued. And he would walk this close. He would walk into work, walk in and say, what's the first song? And they'd tell him what the song was. And, of course, the music of his life, because he'd played those records a few hundred times. He would walk up without headphones on and just walk right up to the microphone and start the record and say, hello, this is Bill Randall on the music of your life. I I've heard that story about people before. I heard that about Gary D. That Gary D would saunter in with a hangover five minutes before the program, eating out of a bag of peanuts, not even having read the newspaper and sit down and expect to do a show. And he would do a show. It was caller driven. If there were no calls, there was no show with Gary D. But Gary D made up for it with moments of brilliance. There were long periods of sheer boredom. You'll have that, I guess. But there were also moments of brilliance. Bill Randall dead at 79 or 80 or 81, depending on what source you get. And seeing as there's no service for him, all they had in today's plain dealer was that he had passed away and that was that, that there would be no service. Just some of the people who he helped along his career were Tony Bennett, Elvis Presley, Patty Page, Pat Boone, Rosemary Clooney, Fats Domino, Bill Haley. And due to the heavy airplay of those records in Cleveland, Ohio, which I don't care what anybody says, Cleveland, Ohio was one real heavy hitter back then. It still is, as far as I'm concerned. I have no plans on leaving, and unless they want me to replace Joe Farnham. <laughs> but uh, Bill Randall was uh, uh, a guy who knew a, a dizzying array of musical artists and helped out many, many people. And I suppose probably could have hurt your career by not playing the record. Stop saying Bill Rand, Rand Gordon. It's Bill Rand. Did I say Bill Gordon? How many times did I say? I see Cliff came in, Cliff Bakley. Bill Gordon? That's Smoochie. Bill Randall. I don't know how many... Forgive me if I kept saying Bill Gordon. Bill, Bill Gordon is still alive. Bill Randall. Both of them, and I will cover my fanny here, both of them Cleveland legends. Bill Randall, I'm sorry, is... Did I say, I, where did my mind go? Ken and Chagrin, you're on the air. Hey, Gilly, how are you tonight? Well, I, I don't know. I'm out of sorts now. Did I say Bill Gordon a hundred times or something? I was following you. I, you may have goofed up a couple times. There you go. Yeah, I'm human. You know, I mean, someone's got to cut you a break, huh? Yeah, well, they're both old, so there. There you go. Hey, um, tell me this. In about 71, when I first started talking and listening to talk radio, and uh, you and I were both about nine, um, w would he have been on 1100 opposite people power? Because I used to call some guy on 1100 that was on in the afternoons, and I've never been able to figure out who it was, you know, 
uh, from a historical perspective. Well, I'm, I, I have the lengthy Plain Dealer article in front of me, but I have to take off my glasses to read it because I need bifocals, and I have not gone out and gotten them. But uh, I know he was... old guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm getting to be an old guy. Well, I know he was on uh, 1300, and of course WRMR in the 90s, and uh, WBBG, he had talk shows, and he had talk, a, sh a talk show on WERE. So it does not say anything about being on 1100. Okay, okay. You, 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 who knows? I mean, you know, it's amazing. Those guys were all over the dial. Well, yeah, they'd go from station to station. I mean, Gary D was on uh, WHK, and in fact, the music of your life, I believe, is now, what, 1420, and tonight at midnight, I think it's changing to news talk. Now, I don't know what that means. Uh, I didn't hear anything or, through the grapevine about uh, anyone being needed for air talent or them looking for anyone, so I'm assuming that it could just be all satellite fed stuff, it could just be all network stuff, and then that's all they're going to do. Yeah, outsourcing of uh, the radio talent. And well, yeah, and a larger topic too is, I've talked with some people about what they call the demise of talk radio. Yeah, yeah, we're going to get down to where you, you, you can only hear the same shows in every city. I travel my rear end off, I'm in, you know, four towns each week, and uh, you know, it's a pleasure to have the character of each town with with a person who lives there and understands, you know, the the city that they're in and and the nuances of them all. And uh, I don't I don't know as if I entirely understand, you know, how programming works in radio. But it seems that even if every Clear Channel station has Rush Limbaugh on it, they also have somebody that's local, local color, local personality, local talent on a big radio station on the big one in their town. I think every town that has a 50,000 watt radio station, they call it the big one. Now, I understand whatever it's called, imaging, you know, across the country. Every town I went to driving around the country had a kiss and a mix and a magic and a big one and that sort of, unless they were a little tiny podunk. But I uh, seem to notice that they also had somebody local in the chair. Well, prediction, just like uh, cable TV, you know, set up the CNNs and the Larry Kings of the world and all that, satellite radio will take over the, uh, you know, the uh, guys that are syndicated everywhere, and, and uh, the, the real airwaves will go back to people like you. Well, here I apologize again. Apparently, I killed Bill Gordon. I, I meant to say Bill Randall. But then again, if I only said it a couple of times, I'm going to stop apologizing for it. Well, I'm I'm sure he'll uh, he'll call in and chime in and let you know he's alive. B Bill Gordon. Yeah. Will he tell me to stay smoochy? Probably. Hey, I'll tell you, all these old ladies in my family that are in their 70s and 80s love Bill Randall, and 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 Bill Gordon comes up too. But I mean, this music of their lives stuff. I mean, that's. That's a, that's a big deal to the people a generation ahead of us. It's amazing the number of, uh, as you put them, old ladies that uh, like me. Oh. <laughs> I don't know whether I'm their surrogate grandson or what. You know what you are, Gilly, is, is you're the most entertaining local non-sports talk show host going. I mean, I, I can't believe WTAM doesn't put you on more frequently with regularity. Um... You know, Kevin Keene drives me nuts. I, I, I would rather hear you every time that he's on. And uh, I, I, we need to have more talk, not just sports talk. And, and uh, I thought of something interesting that was not exactly a feather and cap, but um, they showed something on the television. I was watching the news, and they showed apparently a uh, highway patrol had stopped and they had their dash cam going. It was some kind of a car accident someplace. Chuck Letty. Uh, well, whatever. <laughs> no, it wasn't that. Um, and apparently, they had their dash cam going, and their radio was on in the car. And this was uh, the accident was on the 4th of July. And they said, strangely enough, they don't know why, but the Star Spangled Banner was playing in the background. And I thought... Well, it was probably my program. Over and over and over. And if they listened to any of the versions, there, there weren't too many good ones. No, well, it's difficult to sing, but we, at least we got folks that had the heart to call up on the 4th of July. But I was thinking, what are, I mean, the, the odds are, that gambling Russian, the odds are that that was my radio program that they were listening to because you can easily hear it all over the state of Ohio. So I was assuming that the Highway Patrol in Ohio might be listening. Who knows? Just a wild guess. I have to say this about WTM signal. For a 50,000-watt clear channel signal that supposedly hits 38 states, and again, I travel everywhere, and I, I try hard to listen to it, and it, it is not a very strong or focused signal. Well, at night, 
you know, when the others, when the other stations shut down, yeah, it gets stronger. Out, but now you got to remember that that phrase was coined by another Cleveland radio legend, Pete Franklin. And he coined that 38 states and half of Canada. I don't think, I mean, because if you look at the broadcast area that we are allowed to go to at night, you can count 38 states and half of Canada. That does not necessarily mean written in stone, depending on weather conditions, that we are going to go to 38 states. You know what I mean? We never sat down and said, uh, double your satisfaction or your money back or something like that. I mean, basically, we're only necessary to cover that area in case we have to for an emergency. Yeah. We, we, don't, we don't have to carry 38 states just because we feel like, you know, you want to hear Rick Gilmore while you're in Alabama. Well, that's not written in stone. Well, you know, in Chicago, in the middle of the night, it, it doesn't pick it up, and that's not that far away. I know. Well, here's the deal, though, is that also a friend of mine lives in New York City, and he said he can pick me up. But not in his building, because if there's too much metal in the building or if you're around too many tall buildings. And you have to remember also those 50,000 watch stations were put together for emergencies. That's why they needed to have that. But we also have one in Columbus. There's one in Cincinnati. There's one in Detroit. There's one in Chicago. There's one, you know what I mean? So that it was just a blanket thing that we could help the farmer in the field get in if there was a nuclear attack. That, that's the reason why it was put together. Well, it's it's great to hear you when you're on, and uh, you know let's 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 hope these uh, Ray Davies is listening and, and and knows that there's people that want you on more, and let's make you the Bill Randall of our generation. Okay, the the talk of your life. I'm Rick Gilmore. There you go. Get smooth, Gilly. All right, talk to you Have later. A good one. All right, I already do. Triple Apple forecast from TV3 meteorologist Betsy Kling tonight. Some, you know, this is going on and on, isn't it? Scattered rain and thunderstorms. And it seems like ev every day they're saying scattered rain and thunderstorms. Upper 60s overnight. Sticky out there. If you don't have air conditioning like I do, well, then I guess you have to turn on the fan and have a cold beer. Remember, refrigeration through evaporation. I had a terrible time sleeping a couple nights ago, and I thought, what's going on here? I'm tired. I, I just And I thought about it. I thought, oh, well, I'll go up in the attic and get the fan and put it on low so that it blows on me all night long. And then that way, when you sweat, it doesn't keep waking you up every half hour. And I had just, oh, I'm just so rested, so rested. Tomorrow, guess what? Scattered rain and thunderstorms possible. Low 80s. Tuesday, chance for rain. Go figure. Low 80s. Currently, 82 degrees in Cleveland, 82. Remember, 10 o'clock, Drudge Report, live here on Cleveland's only news radio, WTAM 1100. Well, Paul has a cool story about Bill Randall. You're on the air. Hey, Paul. Uh, yeah, right. Hey, Rick, Paul Orlowski. Oh, uh, Paul Orlowski, how are you? How you been, man? Good to talk to you. Good. I, uh, last time I saw you was, I don't know, someplace in Tremont. Yes, you're, you're exactly right. We were yeah, sitting around talking to each other. at the. I think it was the Flying Monkey or one of those. Was exactly uh, about broadcasting, as a matter of fact. Yeah, that's what we were sitting around talking about. Uh, yeah, broadcasting. I thought Ray Davies was in the Kinks, not uh, your program director. Yeah, all right, that's Ray Davis is the program Ray director. Ray Davis, there you go. They're close, but no, he's on I vacation. Do about, I, I do know about 1420. They're going talk satellite talk, conservative uh, kind of religious. You know, right talk. Yeah, I tuned in uh, uh, AM 1000, and I was listening to somebody who was, I uh, can't think of his name right off the top of my head, but I was thinking, geez, I mean, it was just so conservative, I felt like throwing up on my car radio. Well, it's, it's point counterpoint with you and uh, maybe that them now, but uh, yeah, no, it's, it's all satellite stuff, no local stuff, uh, is my understanding. But oh, okay. the reason I call this is, is uh, you know, uh, Bill Randall. We we put together a uh, an obituary at the station. This guy was so big that right after he left Cleveland, he went to WCBS in New York. And there's an episode of the Honeymooners, and we use this in our obituary, uh, which was the hottest show on CBS television at that time where supposedly, you know, Ralph and Ed write a song and they can't tell the song, and then the song hits, and uh, uh, Ed Norton comes down to the, uh, you know, to Ralph's apartment and says, Ralph, they're going to play our song, they're going to play our song, and they turn the radio on. He goes, Bill Gordon on WCBS is going to play the song, and they turn the radio on. Bill Randall. Hey. You, now you said Gordon. Bill Randall. Yeah, I did. You see, you messed me up. Yeah, I did it. For, for, I've killed off Bill Gordon. And he says, hey, Bill Randall on Here's, you know, here's like a catchy new tune, and he, and he introduces it. And we use it in our obituary, but, I mean, that tells you something about how big the guy was. It was the hottest show, obviously, on, on the CBS television network, and they, you know, decided to showcase him. Uh, so it says something about the guy. I heard about him pulling down a 45 share. 
I mean, that's, that's, that's ungodly. I mean, that, that's, that's more than Goulardi had on TV. Sure. I mean, you know, they talked about Goulardi when that show was on, that crime in Cleveland went down. <laughs> they say that. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's, it's, it's excellent legend. I mean, it's amazing the kind of numbers that people could pull and the kind of audience you could command. I mean, nowadays, you got to imagine you, I, we're all competing against God knows how many different news outlets and media outlets. And, and uh, uh, okay, I don't want to watch TV. I'll just turn, uh, turn on my CD player. Or I don't want to listen to the radio. I'll just listen to satellite radio with no commercials. Or, you know, it's amazing. There's just too much, almost. Or the, too, or the computer, sure. Oh, right. Yeah, I mean, you ever sit down at the computer and you're playing around next thing you know it's the next day <laughs> well, when, I, when i first came here it was like 1979 each basically each station had a 25 share and there were three stations and the, the fight was for the other 25 percent so you're, you know you're talking 20 up in the 20s and now everybody's happy if a, you know, if you get a 10 or 11 that's like phenomenal you know well you got you're on action 19 aren't you Yes, sir. And uh, I, I, I thought it was funny that people used to say 19 Action News, it's rather cartoonish in nature to watch. And I thought, yeah, well, you know what? I'm not going to lie. I watch it because you guys uh, cover all the stories. And, and then I watch Dan Rather because Dan Rather, they cover all the stories. That's what I want. I don't want to have somebody dwell on one thing for 10 minutes. I want to get well, all the news. I hope so. Uh, you know, we're, giving, we're giving a certain amount of freedom, uh, not, certainly not to editorialize, but to say, hey, you know what? The guy didn't answer our question, and so we're we're certainly free to say, "Why don't you answer my question?" Oh, and I love you guys um, sticking at the city hall. I mean, yeah. that, <laughs> I love that. I mean, that's like, look, Mayor Jane Campbell, Ladybug Jane Campbell, the queen of the flying hubcap, said she was going to have a more open administration to the media, and then turned right around and made it a more closed administration than the white administration was. Well, I'm still fighting for for something, and, I, and you know, I, I'm not, I haven't gotten it yet, but just the uh, uh, a list of city employees where they live, and what they make, okay? Right. I haven't gotten it. They're saying, yeah, we understand, and then we've been told this by council. Yeah, we understand we're supposed to give it to you, but we're not going to. Well, you have, you, you have to go through the Ministry of Information. Well, they, but, but they said, no, even I've, I've done that. I've been working on it for six months now. So basically they say, sue you. Well, sue us. Uh, five, seven, eight, eleven hundred in the classic 216 area code talking about the passing of Bill Randall, dead at either 79, 80, or 81, depending on what you, what you read. And uh, Cleveland Radio in general. It's a changing. There are some changes afoot in Cleveland Akron Radio. I see Joe Finan is retiring. Uh, I also have a box. Before I get to, I'm going to open the box on the air. My program director, Ray Davis, not Davies, that Ray Davies is from the Kinks, uh, wrote on it Rick Gilmore's box. So I don't know what's in it. But apparently, and I don't know whether this can, can, can be confirmed or denied if you go to the Peerless Web Design webcam, if you go to WTAM.com. A friend of mine and I were sitting around, and he says, Geez, Rick, you're wearing that wife beater T-shirt and a Hawaiian shirt over it and dark sunglasses and a bit o' the bling. You look like a Costa Rican drug dealer. He says, From now on, your nickname is El Cessna. Apparently, we're flying things in and out. Uh, so I said, well, fine, if I'm El Cessna, then you're Che Guevara. Well, I'm not certain he knew who Che Guevara was right off the get-go there, but uh, Castro's right-hand man, Che Guevara. Shall we open the box before I take another call? It's not very heavy. I don't think it's... Uh, Cliff looked at me through the newsroom window, and he thought it was going to blow up. Well, I don't have a box cutter, but I have a car key. Let's see if this is good enough to get inside this sucker and open it up. Wow, and the computer has gone insane. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not supposed to open the box. There we go. What is in? Jeez. Sheesh. What is in the box? Temporary difficulty. The Rick Gilmore Show will not be heard this evening. Stay tuned for guest host Rick Gilmore. It's a safety helmet. What I thought was a jack strap, but it's too small. It's apparently uh, a breathing mask. Earplugs. Making the world safer, one project at a time. Congratulations, you've just been mailed anthrax. No, it doesn't say that. I don't know. So, 
What, what, am, what am I going to do with this? At least it, it's, it's got the Cleveland Browns colors on it. It's orange and brown and a little white. And... Sheesh. Who knows? All we know is that I did not blow up. WTAM 1100, you're on the air. Hey, buddy, what's up? Hey, Larry, how are you? Hey, you know, maybe your boss or your boss got that for you to protect you from your board off. My producer? Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. At least she plays cool bumper music. Yeah, what happened to your old board op? Well, I have many producers. I have Edmund, I have Patty, you know, it just depends on what's going on. I called earlier, but she cut me off. I was doing my Michael Jackson impersonation. Well, maybe that's why she cut you off. She thought maybe you got some kind of a moron or something, so she wouldn't oh, put I'm you on. a moron. Well, I didn't say you were. Maybe Patty thought you were a moron. She's nodding her head. She thought you were a moron. That's why she hung up. I'm trying to give the show a little levity. Ah, I'm I easy. see. You know me, I'm clean. Gilly been calling the show a long time. Yeah, okay. Hey, we know? want levity. I could always play you the top hundred list of why it's good to be gay. No, I'm not gay. I'm not gay either, but the list is funny. Um, you know what? My, my, should I say that? <laughs> my, my producer Patty's gay. Is she? Yes. Or is her house all tongue and groove? Yeah, no studs. Uh, um, yeah. Hey, you know, that's why I like your show. You, you make me bring, uh, take me back to my childhood. Man, I used to listen to uh, Friday night, the Gallardi, me and my brother's man, we used to stay up. Watched uh, Guardians, little 9-inch Philco TV, black and white, man. Yeah, we had a, we moved up from what you had. We had a 13-inch Admiral. <sighs> Those were the days, buddy. Yeah, my earliest memory was watching Kennedy's funeral and flipping around the dial because I wanted to see what was on the other stations. Well, that's what was on the other stations. Oh, yeah, I remember that, too. My father was telling, I remember I was a little kid, and my dad told me, he says, you watch this, this is going to be history one day. You watch this. I don't want to watch that. Well, I remember my father waking me up in 1969 and saying, you got to watch the moon landing. This is going to be history. And I thought, I want to go back to bed. I mean, to me, I was just, a, I was, whatever, eight years old, and he was right. It, it is history, and it was history, and it was a good thing he woke me up. Uh, at the time, when you're eight, you just wanted to go back to bed. Yeah, the good old days, buddy. Oh, yeah. When gas was real gasoline, and cars were cars. We have something important going on? Hello? Yes. Hello. I, Mark Twain once said, the report of my death has been grossly exaggerated. Smoochie! That's right! Bill Gordon, I recognize your voice. I couldn't believe I was slipping and, and saying that you passed away, which you of course... You said I passed away, and don't you want to know where I'm calling from? Um, sure. They want ice water here. I did die. I am in hell with all of my buddies. <laughs> yeah, all the other radio you people. That you're going to join me someday. Yes, all radio people end up south of the border. Absolutely. There's no other way. If you get it in your blood, you start broadcasting, you end up where they really want ice water. No, but that was really funny. Somebody called me. I regret to say I wasn't watching, listening to the show at that moment. They said, Bill Gordon? I said, yeah. He said, they just reported you died. I said, I've killed I said, off. Who's the other? It's Bill Randall. Yeah, I said, I've killed, I've accidentally killed. Killed off Bill Gordon. <laughs> now, well, they've been trying to do that for years, you know. Well, that's true. But you always stay smoochy. Oh, absolutely. Now, I, uh, I, my, my friend Flash Gordon was a producer for Bill Randall. I never met the man. Do you have any observations on his life? On Bill Randall? Yes. He was, without a doubt, the greatest promoter and the greatest disc jockey. That's somebody who plays records. Right. I was never a disc jockey. I was never a promoter. I was a radio, television entertainer and a performer. There's a world of difference. But he, uh, he knew how to do it. He knew how to promote. And he even promoted right on through up until the very end and even a day past the very end. Well, you know Norman Knight, right? Norman Knight, you a big rock and roll guy. Right, and uh, I'm friends with Norman, and he was telling me, he says, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, uh, and it faded a bit after the 50s, but into the, uh, into the early 60s, perhaps. He says, when you would go see a band, they would be introduced by somebody like Alan Freed or right. Bill Randall. He right. says, more people applauded for the, di the disc jockey than for the band. He says, they were th the disc jockey was the star. I never understood that either because the disc jockey usually didn't really have a heck of a lot of talent. All they had was a glib tongue, and they would say, and now, here are the boys with the talent. And that was really the extent of their, of their message. But because they were on the radio every day, people got into the habit of listening to them in the cars and at home, and the next thing you know, they became huge stars. You're absolutely right. 
and I, I just thought it was interesting how that, that changed and faded away. But I, I understand where you're coming from, too, Bill Garden, because I have people say, oh, that's, that's my friend Rick Gilmore. He's a disc jockey. And I said, I'm not a disc jockey. I don't play records. I mean, and I'm not, meant, I'm not meant to, you know, I'm not condescending when I say that. I just mean, I don't play records. Yeah, you're not in the category of what they call DJ. But the term DJ became so ubiquitous that everybody calls everybody who does anything on radio or television where they talk. If, if they talk on the phone with somebody, then they're a DJ, which is ridiculous. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, you know, I was talking with uh, some people that did know Bill Randall, and they said, Above all else, he was one heck of a salesperson. He was a marvelous... He, he learned all that from a guy who was the greatest in the history of broadcasting. And that guy was named Arthur Godfrey. Yeah. Arthur, hello. Hiya, my friend. This is Arthur Godfrey. And he was a great... He could make you want... He could really sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo. Yeah, was, you ever seen the movie A Face in the Crowd? Yes. I think Elia Kazan directed it. 1957. It was Andy Griffith's probably first. That's big... right. Boy, you got a good you got a good research that that's right and i love the movie it's a four-star film and andy andy griffith i'll tell you mm, mm, Aunt B, well he was not the character that he played on mayberry he was the character more closely related to what he's like in real life which was apparently not the nicest feller i talked to a guy who comes from his hometown who said he won't even come back there to uh go to the bathroom really i think i don't know he came here years and years and years before he had a record that the thing that started Andy off was a record called What It Was, was football. Yep, and then they come out, and I believe I'll have me another big orange. I'll have a big orange. Yep, <laughs> and it, it, it described a guy who had no idea what a football game was, and, right. he, and he was watching it. And I did a program one night where I went on the radio and said, explain football to me. And it was amazing the correlation between that and what it was. And the thing with Andy Griffith and a face in the crowd was, I believe, unless I'm mistaken, Bill Smoochie Gordon, that he was playing a character based on Arthur Godfrey, who was a country bumpkin who came from nowhere and kind went of. and went to be the biggest star on television. Yeah, you could you could kind of yeah, I think so. I don't know if it was really based on Godfrey, but there seems to be sort of a relationship there, I guess. Yeah, because I had heard stories about Godfrey and how he was not the nicest feller in the world. I mean. Uh, Julius La Rosa was, uh, wasn't that a singer on his show that got more mail than Godfrey did one week, so Godfrey humiliated him and fired him on the air. Julius La Rosa, and he fired him right on the air, and Tony Marvin, gee, I don't know what that, I can remember all those things from 40 and 50 years ago, I can't remember what I did last week. Not a bad memory for me, because I'm only 43. <laughs> You're doing good. Yeah, I like to research stuff like that, and I think history of entertainment is important, that's why I wanted to talk about Bill Randall tonight, because... What, what other chance am I going to have? Next week? I mean, he'll... Yeah, be, that's the thing about when you kick off. One week later, it's like you never even existed at all. You know, the name that does come back over and over is Gary D. Yeah, I hear that little bit. Gary D does sort of a poor Don Imus imitation, kind of, I think. That's sort of where that sort of... That same type of... Uh, humor, I guess you would call it, or biting satire or something like that. Yeah, he, he had... I like to say, when I used to listen to Gary D, there were long moments of boredom, but small stretches of sheer brilliance. <laughs> yeah. There would be something that would... I mean, I heard the story about people driving down the highway, and there was some sort of gridlock, and everybody had to stop. And this guy says... He was listening to Gary D, and Gary said something hilarious. And he says he looked around, and everyone else and all the other cars were laughing. He knew they were all listening to the same program. Funny you should mention it. I'm here in my living room in Euclid, Ohio, and there's a sign up on my wall that I have framed. It's a sticker that was put on windshields all over Cleveland years ago, and it says on the sticker, I'm not really crazy, just listening to Bill Gordon on WHK. <laughs> and what it was, was there was a guy who was in the printing business, and he heard somebody on my show say, man, I was in the car and you said some joke and it just knocked me out. I was laughing so hard I couldn't stand it. And everybody was looking at me and he says, I want to tell him I'm not really crazy. I'm just listening to you. And this fellow heard that from Adams Printing Company, it was, and he printed up thousands of these blue, uh, blue on the outside stickers and people put them on their windshields and it was really amazing. So this is, you know, everybody in radio has similar stories all over the country. It's like there's a Halley Brothers department store in, like, similar in Memphis, Tennessee and in Chillicothe, Ohio and in Akron. And, you know, it just goes on and on and on. We're all just human beings trying to do the best we can. Yeah, and, and it's amazing how... 
And I'm not certain if it still does it, Bill Gordon. The, the, you know, it used to be, because like I said, I was talking earlier with Paul Orlowski, and I, I says, it, there used to be a few things to listen to and a few things to watch, and now there's bazillions of things to listen to and watch. And, it, None it, of it any good. It, it, not a lot of them any good, and, there's, and it does not have that polarizing effect that it used to where people would sit around. I remember when I got hired at this station oh, almost seven years ago, my uh, program director at the time said, Rick, I want you to have a long, fruitful career. You've got a cult following. I don't want you to have a cult following. I want you to have a long, fruitful career. And I thought, I'm still stuck with the cult following, <laughs> and I'm happy about that. Appeal to the masses, eat with the classes. Appeal to the classes, eat with the masses. But you mentioned a name that rings the bell with me, Paul Orlovsky. Yes. I always remembered him as a class guy. I only met him once, I think, or twice, but I always liked I think he's the one who's on television every once in a while, like a reporter on the street. Yes, he's at 19 Action News. Well, he's very, I think he's, I think he's network material. I always did. Yeah, he's a very nice guy, and I sat down one time at a, a bar, <clears throat> pardon me, a bar in my neighborhood where I live, and we sat down and talked about broadcasting and TV and radio, and uh, I, I love bumping into other broadcasters. That's, that's the biggest thrill I can have is when somebody says to me, you know, I bumped into so-and-so, like uh, Mike Snyder told me, our, our sports director, he says, I bumped into Joe Tate. He says, you know, Tate doesn't like a whole lot of broadcasters. He talk. But he, he says, Tate doesn't like anybody in, in broadcasting, but you're his favorite broadcaster. And I said, well, Boy. I'll take it. That's an you're honor. Kidding. So... You're not kidding. That's a wonderful compliment. No, I know. That's what I thought. I, I love bumping into other broadcasters and people that do TV or radio and have them say I had Well, anytime not. you want me to call, just go on the radio. Yes. On your 50,000 water and say... You're dead. Bill Gordon died. Yes. <laughs> and then... And I'll call up and, and vehemently deny it. But for years, for some reason, in Cleveland, Ohio, people say, when they meet me, they'll, oh, Bill Randall, I'm your biggest fan. I say, wait, wait a minute, hold it. You got the wrong one. I'm not, I'm the good one. I'm Bill Gordon, the good guy. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Talk to you later. But I want you to know I'm not dead. Uh, you're not dead, but I will. And I mean, I'm so glad now that I made that mistake, because now I know in the future, if I want to conjure you up, I'll just say three times that Bill Gordon's dead Bill on the Gordon's radio. Bill Gordon's gone, and then say... Stay smoochy, you rascal, you. Yep. Sorry. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Bye, Rick. Bye-bye. Bill Smoochy Gordon, another Cleveland legend who is not dead. Larry. Hey, that's no problem, buddy. It was good listening to that, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad Bill called. you want to do the weather with me? Sure. It's from TV3 meteorologist Betsy Kling tonight. What do you think? I heard it's supposed to snow. No, rain. Not snow. I can't do no plowing tonight, I guess. No, nope, you can't. Upper 60s. Now, tomorrow, what do you think it's supposed to do? It's going to rain, dude. No, it's going to snow. No, actually, it's not going to snow. Tomorrow, possible thunderstorms out there. What do you think the high's going to be? Uh, probably about 86. Low 80s. I washed my car, so I know it's going to rain. But there, you did it. I always do. Every time I wash my car or truck, it's going to rain. You're the one. Currently, what do you think it is right now? Um, uh, 79 out there? Yeah, 70, you're at, you, wow, you're exactly right. I just take, took a guess. There you go, yeah, 79. And you, you know who comes up at 10 o'clock? Um, uh, Eileen McShay? 10 o'clock, Drudge Report. Oh, I, I, I want to hear Eileen McShay. Eileen does not do a talk show. Eileen is a TV3 meteorologist. I know, I'm so Okay, kidding. well, someday she may do a talk show, but no, at 10 o'clock you get the Drudge Report live. I uh, turn the radio off. Oh, okay. I listen just for you, dude. I wish you had more time on the radio. Well, you're an icon in Cleveland. Well, boy. You, you, you're like, you know, I mean, the, the last person in Cleveland was that good was Gary D. And I used to listen to Gary D. a long time ago when I first got my first job. And that's what we listened to. And I don't know if you take that as, a, uh, you know, I don't know as an insult or nothing like that. No, no, not at all. No, I, I just had a passing thought that I thought uh, Cleveland's biggest radio bigwig, Jim Meltzer, loves listening to my program, and so does his wife. And I thought, well, gee, pull some strings and make sure I'm on the air more often. Then you could love listening to me more often instead of twice a month. I'm serious, Rick. You do get a call for it because I talk to so many people. I've turned so many people onto your show that they look forward to your show, and they ask, they call me up and says, when's he going to be on? I say, I don't know. you got to listen to the radio. Why do I have some guy on line one that wants to know if I own my own popcorn factory? I mean, I, I, I... Hey, you know what, Rick? I don't, I'm going to let you go, and you have a going, buddy. All right, thank you. I have my own... I have to find out. Uh, Dennis, you're on the air. Hey, Gilly, how you doing? Good. Hey, listen, you and I usually talk cars and stuff, but sure. I swear on my father's grave. 
what I have in my lap. I don't know where it came. I think my brother brought this from somewhere. But it's a bag of microwave popcorn, and it's Gilmore Gourmet Butter Microwave Popcorn. How's it spelled? G-I-L-M-O-R-E. Yep, see, I'm, my name's M-O-U-R. Oh, more you are. Yeah. Well, anyway, I was thinking about you. There you go. I, I, I'm thinking maybe you're on the popcorn business on the side because they're not giving you enough air time. Uh, I don't know. But no, I'm not in the popcorn business. Okay. But it's something to consider. Orville Gillybacher. There you go. Yeah. That sounds catchy. That'll work. Well, it, sure. I'll pick up a sideline. Sure. All right. Okay, Rick. Good talking to you, buddy. You too. Bill, you're in the air. Hey, yeah, I just wanted to comment about that uh, guy who called up about the strength of your signal. Yes. I picked you up in South Carolina, I think it was, North or South Carolina. I, I listened to I, an Indians game Yeah. and heard the local commercials. I picked up this station in the morning. I listened to Wills and Coleman in the morning, heard weekdays 5 until 9 here on Cleveland's only news radio, WTAM 1100, at like oh, 8 in the morning in Fort Lauderdale. Now, we're not yes. supposed to go down there, right? It must have been some kind of bleed because it was July, and it was at 8 in the morning, and I was listening to Wills and Coleman. Now, granted, it was a little scratchy, but it came in enough to listen to it. Yeah, and, and I just want to ask you one other thing. When you were talking about all these great broadcasters, how come you left out Howard Stern? Well, Howard Stern is a great broadcaster. There's no, I, I, I have had that debate with people. Oh, Howard stinks. I can't listen. Well, no, I can't listen either. Because it, it's all the same thing, breasts and this and that, all over and over and over and over and over. And, I mean, but when you listened on, say, I did not hear it, I was sick in bed on 9-11. But people were listening, and Howard was on the air. And if you can be a serious broadcaster when the excrement hits the oscillator and carry on your program, well, then you're oh, doing a good job. Uh, if you say the wrong thing and get yourself in trouble, well, maybe you're just a borderline, borderline. I love when people do that. Do they try and sneak the name in on the air? Uh, what's the difference? I was told that seven years ago, too. Somebody wants to call up and mention somebody else on the radio on some other station. What do we care? What does it matter? To deny them saying so is to act as if you are small and unimportant. And we are not. Al, you're on the big one, WTAM 1100. Hey, Rick, how are you? All right. You know, it was terrific to hear Bill Gordon on again. You know, he pioneered talk radio in Cleveland. He had the first talk radio program way back in the 60s. It was called Apartment 13. And he'd have guests right in his apartment, you know, and they'd chat on different topics. But he was actually the pioneer. Yeah, it's funny. Mean, funny how talk radio... Uh, was small and then got really big and then got small for a while, but it's big again now. It's weird. He was he was the pioneer in Cleveland. I believe you, absolutely. Yeah, and what, what you got to do is either you ought to have him on or Trivisano ought to have him on for an extended period, you know? Well, I had him on for an extended period. Oh, you mean like a couple hours? Before, yeah, sure, before uh, he goes so way up Bill Rand, though, you know? Well. He was, he was terrific. All I have to do when I want him back sometime, some week I'll just start talking about how he died, and yeah, then they'll yeah. say, no, he didn't, and he'll call. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, in fact, the, the pioneer. The program was called Apartment 13. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how many times in the future I can kill him off. <laughs> okay. All right. Sure. All right. Talk to you later. Reminds me of a story of a guy named Whit Bissell. He was an actor, kind of a B-movie actor. I believe Whit Bissell was the doctor, and I was a teenage werewolf with Michael Landon. And I was looking through the plane dealer one day, and I saw Whit Bissell died. Oh, Okay. So about three, four years later, I'm looking through the plane dealer, and it says Whit Bissell died. And about three, four years later, Whit Bissell died. And I thought, somebody is having the time of their life pulling one over on media outlets, conjuring up the name of some guy who I, I don't know when Whit Bissell died. I swear to you, he died three times. Somebody, I, I don't know where, somebody at the AP, somebody with a computer, somebody playing around, but they killed Whit Bissell off many times. And I just thought that was a bit unusual that they could actually get away with that. I mean, are the people in the newsrooms on, uh, you know, say at, at a newspaper, are they so lazy that if something comes along, they don't double check it? Well, if somebody was playing games at the AP, well, one would assume that when something comes down the AP wire, it's written in stone. So whoever killed Whit Bissell off that works for the AP needs to go because... <laughs> 
We don't need information ever coming down. We don't need to hear about the same guy dying three different times. I'm going out for a cigarette. You'll hear more of the program after these important words and coverage of what in the world's happening on Cleveland's only news radio station. I'm Rick Gilmore, the thinking man's friend, and this is WTAM 1100. 100, 100. About uh, how, if you did not know and you're just tuning in, Bill Randall, not only did he have a hand in making the careers of Elvis Presley, Tony Bennett, Patty Page, Pat Boone, Rosemary Clooney, Fats Domino, Bill Haley, and others by heavy rotation and airplay of their, of their music. Uh, he, Flash told me, you know, he also invented, though Randall invented the sock hop, or so I am told. And it was the idea that you would go dancing on the gym floor and you could not wear your street shoes. So you had to take your shoes off and dance around with your socks on. Because you couldn't, obviously, you couldn't do the twist or whatever, or the jitterbug or whatever they were doing back then uh, with bare feet on waxed wood. You had to, uh, and I heard something else interesting. You know, it's funny, I had played something on the air about the JFK assassination, something really odd, a musical a melange of music and news clips. And all during the week, I had bumped into people who had heard it, and we ended up talking about JFK. I don't know why it came up. But they said if you watch the, the, the Zapruder film, and I know this is old news, but it was still interesting. If you watch the Zapruder film very closely, at no time in the motorcade route... Is the turn signal used on the Lincoln Continental limousine until the point where there is no turn to go around and the turn signal comes on on the Lincoln Continental. And that, at that point, that was when Kennedy was shot. And from the front and the rear, not just the rear. If you know anything about bullets and firearms and trajectory, you do not have an exit wound from the rear of the head from a bullet coming in from the front. I mean, I'm sorry, from the rear. It has to come in from the front to go out the back. And that's that. I mean, there's, there is no disputing the fact that there was more than one shooter. And the motorcade sped on. Dan, you're on the air. Hey, Rick, how you doing? All right. It was so good to hear Bill Gordon. I actually, too, thought he was dead, passed away. Oh, I knew he wasn't dead. I just slipped and said Bill Gordon instead of Bill Randall a couple of times. And I wonder, uh, do you remember when he used, I don't remember his radio career, but remember when he was on 1 O'Clock Club with Dorothy Fulltime and Ron Penfound? See, that's what I was thinking when they said Apartment 13. I thought, I don't remember that, but I remember that, what was it called again, the 1 O'Clock Club? 1 O'Clock Club. Came on right after, quote-unquote, Captain Penny. <laughs> yeah, and I heard stories about Captain Penny um, yeah. drank a bit. I heard the same stories, too. I heard that he had something like a 57 or 58 Oldsmobile convertible and that he would fill the trunk with ice and beer. I, I, I don't know about that, but I did hear he drank a little bit. Yeah, I heard that from uh, someone who would know. Uh, and I heard, uh, it was so good to hear Bill Gordon again. It made me feel rather old. <laughs> oh, well, don't feel old. I mean, I think it's important when we have the passing of someone who... I, mean, well, I remember clearly, I was on the air on uh, the other little station up the dial when Gary D. passed away, and I believe we did the only program that I heard on the radio that was a tribute to Gary D. I got a chance to meet and party with Gary D. a few times. I knew some of his producers and friends, and he was... A, 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 it was so hard to describe him. Sometimes his, his off-the-air personality was very like his on the air, and other times he was this nice, quiet guy who sat there and drank and carried on normal conversations. Sounds like me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I heard, good night, sir. All right, talk to you later. I heard a story about Gary D. that he was doing some kind of protest out in public, uh, downtown, and the police showed up, and they said, you got to break this up. There's a couple hundred people standing around, and we can't have this. And he said, all right, everybody, follow me. Drinks are on me. And he walked in the front door of a bar, and about 100 people followed him, and they all ordered drinks, to which they looked around for Mr. Gilbert to pay the tab, and he had apparently walked out the back door. <laughs> now, now, that's a story, isn't it? How about the East, East 34th Street Bridge incident? There was a bridge in East 34th, apparently, had some chuck holes or problems, and he went out there and parked his car and sat on the hood until the police showed up and arrested him. And they took him to jail, and he wanted to have a cigarette, and he was broadcasting from his jail cell. Or, or somebody came up to him and was trying to borrow a cigarette. You know, don't you just hate that? that? Do you ever have any friends that decided that they're going to not really quit smoking, they're just going to quit buying? 
And that they come up to me constantly. Now, if somebody comes up to me and gives me a dollar and says, can I have a couple of cigarettes? Oh, that's fine, right? I smoke menthols and non-menthols. I'm goofy like that. I like menthols, but they give me a sore throat, so I switch off. So now I'm the guy that, if you ever see anybody sitting in a bar or a restaurant or whatever on a regular basis with menthols and non-menthols, You've got enough to go around, apparently, for anybody and everybody, right? You can find something to please anyone. Now, dumb, dumb me, people would come up and say, can I have a cigarette? Can I borrow a cigarette? Uh, you know, borrow? Well, are you going to give it back when you're done? Well, and I'd say, what do you want, menthol or non-menthol? I thought it was a novelty act. It's not a novelty act. It gets to the point where that's all the... Now they know you're the source for any kind of cigarettes they want. Now, if you want to buy me a beer, because I have to give you a couple cigarettes, well, that's fine. That's a fair exchange. Cigarettes are not cheap. I have gone now to whatever brand I can get along with. You know how you were always brand loyal? I smoked Newport Lights forever. Forever. Now, is this a racial thing? In my neighborhood, if you try to buy Newports or beer, because there's a lot of people that live in the projects that don't have a car, so they have to walk, the store owners jack the price of stuff up that apparently is purchased by minorities. Now, is that a blanket statement that minorities smoke menthols? I don't know, but I do know that I don't smoke Newports anymore because they're $4 a pack, whereas you can get Basics or one of the, you know, the lesser brands, Turnies or one of those, Highways or whatever, you know, for what, two fifty, Something like that. Well, I, I don't need to be brand loyal to cigarette companies, and I don't, I don't care anymore. I'll buy whatever is the cheapest. I'll go in places. Do you have Pall Malls? No. Do you have Doral's? No. Do you have Basic? Yeah. Okay, I'll take them. I'll take whatever's... When they're handing out free cigarettes at a bar, when they come in, you know, camel bars, where all the ashtrays are camel ashtrays, and I am the... I'm, I'm, these people don't know what I do for a living, but they come in there to a place I go to. I'm the first person standing.